sexiness. Um, sexiness and nirvana and reality. Um, I have a, a favorite. I call it a. I call it a sutra. It's like a play. It's a medieval Sri Lankan uh, sata, labeled as a sata. I don't know if it's an actual sata. It's more of a string of ideas. It's more like a play, right? The uh, the main crux of it, I think, is overcoming the body. And I think when you when when a person overcomes the body. And becomes victorious, it becomes a king, a jina, jina of sorts, uh, a dharma king, maybe you want to call it, dharma king. Um, that understanding can't be destroyed. So, yet, it doesn't mean that they do not repeat, they do not continually go through a cycle of re-becoming and re-becoming and re-becoming like a dumbass, yet that understanding doesn't get destroyed. So the cycle of reincarnation there, you know, is it's much different than in a person who never had that experience. Um, and yet it's interesting too, because in Sri Lanka they have a, a Buddha relic of a tooth and that they take this tooth out and parade it about like once a year on top of a elephant. Elephants represent wisdom in Buddhism. Uh, and venerate an aspect of the Buddha's body. There's um, in uh, Islam, you know, my, my opinion of Islam is that Islam is like Baha'i. It's like an amalgamated religion. Um, much like Christianity is an amalgamated religion, and then uh, it's an amalgamated religion of a certain in a certain period of time in history. So it reflects that era of time in history, and is often expand goes beyond cultures and or in includes numerous cultures and different countries and different philosophies and all kinds of different things. Uh, Islam includes a lot of like Hinduism and Buddhism and East Indian religion and philosophy, as well as a lot of, you know, Judaic and Christian type uh, philosophies and stuff. It's a blended religion, in my honest opinion. I, I know you would never get any uh, Islamic person to agree with that, but that's, I'm pretty sure it is. And that's why in, in Islam, you know, worshiping a statue is considered idolatry. Idolatry. Uh, if you look at ancient India, uh, ancient Buddhism, uh, the Buddha decreed to never make a statue of him. There's one statue of the Buddha with this big crazy mustache, and we kind of think that maybe that is what Shakyamuni Buddha looked like. But then you have to define, get into defining what is a Buddha. That gets hard. But that's not the point of this vlog. Uh, the point of this vlog is it's, is defining what's real. Uh, so and then in that Sutta Sutra, whatever you want to play, whatever you want to call it, um, the Buddha is talking to the monks and he says, uh, look homies, uh, the body's not real. It's not, um, you know, it's it's going to decay. Uh, it's going to pass away. Um, it's going to fall apart. It's prone to disease. You know, what is real is this mind. You know, this mind is never, never changes, never dies, never decays, never... Um, falters, that might be hard to pay to it, never, it's never wrong, it's never wrong, it's never decrepit, uh, 
never decadent, you know. He's talking about uh, Nirvana, Nibbana, the Pure Lands, Sukhavati. That mind is pure, neither pure nor impure. Uh, perception is neither perception nor non perception. And the people who experience it realize that it's, it's very much more of substance than anything else, including the body. However, uh, you can't have a body without having this mind. You can't have this mind without having this body, I think. I mean, you, if you look at animals, animals have gender, but do animals have gender discrimination? And like, do animals say like, you're female, you're male, you're not female, you're not male. They don't have, I don't think animals have cognitive gender discrimination, right? You know, if you look at humans, humans have cognitive discrimination as to being, as to what is male and what is not female. And there's no consensus on that. All of this, like, like what is, is gender is, is literally just a bunch of people trying to beat into submission and fight over what it is to be male or female or whether or not you can be something in between, right? Quite literally. There's no, there's no defining this. There's no, um, clear boundary. Uh, the same is true of, of sex. What is of sexiness? What it is that is attractive? If you look at like, throughout history, you know, what, what is an attractive woman has, has changed so much, so much. Like it goes through like such rapid changes, you know, even in the last 50 years, you know, we've had, we've had models like Twiggy, you know, hence the name Twiggy because she was like a twig. Um, we've had uh, plus size models who've become famous. You know, uh, at one time you would have never had a, a famous black model. And now a famous black model is, is just as common as sliced bread, right? Uh, or a colored model, I would say even not just not just a black model, but a colored model. Um, what what is a sexy male has changed, you know? But if you look at the, the reality of it, you can't nail what's sexy to the to a to the wall, right? It's like trying to nail Jello to a tree. You can't do it. You know what what is sexy is is utterly momentary. You know, what, what one person finds sexy, another person, another person might find completely revolting, right? If you look at, uh, if you look at it, take me for example, right? Skin is an organ, right? I'm pre-op, right? So my genitalia, part of which is on the outside, part of which is on the inside, right, is is not me, right? It doesn't define me. This defines me, you know? But then I struggle with other people who, who, you, who pit their head against mine, you know? Tete -tet -tet, you know, to, in some sort of battle to define what I am. You know, I think logically, I define what I am. You know, logically, it's more beneficial for me to have autonomy over my own definition of what I am versus what I'm not. If you look at some people who are mixed, they're like mixed Chinese, European type person, 
Sometimes they identify just as Chinese. I don't know why. I find it kind of insulting in my culture. Yet, it's not for me to, to, to define. It's not my decision. You know, and the reason why the person may be doing it in my culture might might be the reasons may be numerous. You know, like I don't know. It could be there could be numerous reasons why a person would want to define themselves as being something of a minority as opposed to something of the majority in my culture. You know, maybe there'll come a day in time where in my culture, you know, being white will be something special because you'll be a minority, right? And then yet, in, within that culture, everybody will still be defined as being Canadian. You know? Even if the people in that culture don't define themselves as that. So it gets really screwy. Um, but sexiness has... You can, you can have a gay guy who will find this type of guy attractive at this point in time in their life. And then a female might share that same viewpoint. That's an attractive guy. And then that might all change on a dime. That type of guy may no longer be attractive because of the way society is. And that will again change to be something else. One minute it's like, uh, I, I don't know. One minute it's Fonzie. You know, the next minute it's like The Rock. Right? I, I mean, it's so hard to pin down what makes an attractive person in general. Especially when you're talking about men. It, it's so hard to like pin down what 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 that is there's there's so much variance there that it's and it, because it's subject to not just physical attraction i mean women tend to be more subject to to physical attraction to like body parts and whatnot than than men do but and then that changes too you know It's all a matter of perception. It's literally a matter of perception. It's like an opinion. You, you could say that opinions on trans people is not real because it's literally an ever-changing an opinion from person to person to person to person. Um, and I think Reaching a point in Buddhist practice of liberating yourself of those is aiming towards that is what you need to do. Uh, the famous Chan teacher, Lindsay, um, said that you have to seek it. You have to seek this mind. It's not coming to you if you don't. Right? And yet the way to seek it is to not seek it. In the Kaodong tradition, the Soto Zen tradition, they say, you don't want to seek it. And yet they spend hours and hours and hours in meditation seeking it over and over and over again. Uh, and then the methodologies to do that, there's this famous story that's like the most cliche Zen koan type thing, going on, um, where Matsu Dao Yi is sitting there in meditation. He, he's decided he's going to become a monk and he runs away from home and joins a monastery. And then he's sitting there in meditation, you know, hour after hour, day after day. And then some other 
older monk comes by and starts grinding a tile, a stone, against another stone and disrupts his meditation. And and Matsu Dai Yi kind of goes to him, you know, dude, what you doing? You know, and the other guy says, what are you doing? He says, trying to become a Buddha. Da, what do you think I'm doing sitting here? You know, and then the other guy says, that's what I'm doing. You know, he, he says, how are you going to do that through meditation? And he kind of like starts grinding the stone again, you know, and he says, that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to become a Buddha. The methodology, the, the understanding is the same, but the methodology is different. Sitting in meditation is very much a, a much more apt way of going about a much more beneficial way, a much more successful way, in my honest opinion, of aiming to become a Buddha than tr attempting to grind a rock. But if you have that type of mind, sitting in Zazen, sitting in Shikantaza, Juwang, is Vipassana is all the same. You know, you're you're entering into that mind from all different types of like angles or ideas or practices or whatever you want to call it. But only if you have that mind. If you don't have that mind, because you haven't been doing Sita meditation, then you don't really comprehend that, right? That's my that's my that's my beef about just chanting and not meditating. I don't know that just chanting isn't possible, but it's much less focused than seated meditation, right? And what is sexy is completely unfocused. You know, it's not, it's something so utterly fleeting and people chase after it and chase after it and chase after it. They chase after it to be it. They chase after it to have it. They chase after it to consume it, you know, and they eat something that they never get because it's utterly changing all the time. You know, you, it's almost pointless to attempt to be sexy because it's something that's just utterly changing endlessly. You can look at time. Um, we say that time is real, right? We, we carry watches. Um, we work by the clock, you know? The clock dictates our lives, literally. Um, and yet, the clock is a man-made concept. It's a man-made construct. The idea, this, this rigid idea that we have of time is a man-made concept. I don't think this rigid idea of time exists. I don't, I don't know that you could have physics today without the, without the concept of time, because physics is so mathematical, right? You, if you subtract the idea of time, you, you destroy Einstein's concept of relativity. Like the formula, for Einstein's concept of relativity no longer works when you subtract time from it, in my honest opinion. Um, and if you look at, if you attempt to see things of time, cyclical things of time in, in the world or the universe around us, like day and night, I don't, I don't think there's any, it's not that specific. Day and night might be as close to a specific aspect of time that we could possibly imagine. And yet, none of us can say with, with certainty that the sun is coming up tomorrow or at what time. If you can predict it, we'll probably be right. Can't say that it's 100% right. You know, and it's hard to, if we didn't have our current concept of time, which is our concept of time now, our concept of time in the past was different. Our concept of time in the future may be different. Uh, it's not something that's substantially real. 
It's just something that we utilize as a measure. You might be able to say the same thing with gender. Or sexiness. Or what is sexy? Um, getting back to the, the genitalia idea, uh, my skin is an organ, right? But my skin does not define me. My heart doesn't define me. My lungs do not define me. They don't define me as male or female. Um, but we say that my genitalia defines me as male or female. You know, what is it that I define me as? Right? So many people argue that. So many people argue that. I think if you look at um, the reason why trans women uh, if from my perspective, the reason why a lot of trans women want relationships is to validate their gender identity. I think it, it validates their sense of identity. And that's why when those relationships fall apart, it impacts them so incredibly hard because they no longer have this other person who validates them, validates them as uh, a female in a, in a straight relationship or as a, a female in a lesbian relationship, right? I don't know if the same applies to trans men. I don't know, but it, it definitely seems to be the case with trans women that when when the breakup happens or they get rejected, it just decimates them. In my opinion, in my experience. Um, but like my genitalia doesn't define me any more than say my skin defines me. You know, it, it's like saying it's such a vicious, it's like cyclic argument. <laughs> it's, you know, everybody out there nowadays is so hyped on defining what is, what is male and what is female. Um, if you can be a third gender, if you're, if you can be, I uh, just so many things, I don't know. 